update published Thursday, 1st February 2018 to 24. Send your thoughts to theater at football365.com to feel good about yourself. Jose is gonna joke Cole Sanchez I've no time for United but I do still love Alexis Sanchez. Those sorts of players that can take a game by the scruff of its neck regardless of everyone else is doing are few and far between. Morinho's going to destroy him ISNT he and that makes me sad because we've seen this before. When I was at secondary school I only remember us winning the Islington School's trophy once. And that was the year a legend emerged about a boy who would literally take the ball from one end of the field to another and score goal after goal. That boy would go on to sign for West Ham and become the second old boy from my school to score at a World Cup. Gary Breen was the first. His name was Joe Cole and it saddens me how Jose took all the joy out of watching him play by turning him into a glorified left back. I can only hope Jose is fired before he does the same with Alexis Graham Simons Gooner. North London Planet Sport recommends the day Paolo Maldini tried his hand at professional tennis. Tennis 365 Morinho installed his own ceiling NAS. In this morning's mailbox thinks the current United manager is getting an easy ride and him of a mind to both agree and attempt to rectify that. First, a disclaimer. Morinho is obviously a really successful football manager in various leagues across Europe with differing levels of financial might to assist him. Has almost certainly forgotten more about top-level football than he'll ever know. But him always hearing football is a game of opinion so here's mine unless he shows a willingness to adapt to the club and players Hess managing. Rather than vice versa, Hell always imposed a ceiling on his own achievements. Invoking Ferguson in any managerial comparison feels almost like cheating. But one of the reasons Ferguson was, and crucially remained, so successful throughout his long career was his willingness to discard old. Proven dogma and embrace a new way of doing things. This can be seen in the differing ways he approached the celebrity status of initially Beckham and later Ronaldo. Stick or flying boot was replaced with carrot to great effect. He also changed his backroom staff and tactics frequently throughout his time at United. It's this latter point that seems most pertinent to the current incarnation of Morinho. Rui Faria et al. have been virtual ever presents throughout Morinho's career. So too, seemingly, his devotion to 4-2-3-1. There's nothing wrong with 4-2-3-1, Spurs used a version of it to devastating effect last night. It's only a problem when none of the very good players in your team benefit from its deployment. Pogba doesn't have the discipline to play in a double pivot, he really should have, but he doesn't. There are no natural wingers in the squad. Our only natural number 10 is the adorable but incredibly slow and weak Mata who never plays there anyway. And Lukaku has none of the actual skill set required of a Morinho lone center forward looks like he should be a great hold-up player but is actually a quick, intelligent runner who can finish. Yet despite all this and having natural if limited attacking full backs, we so rarely see a proper 4-3-3 deployed. The last occasion was Everett in a way where we took a half to get used to it. Then dominated the second half, scoring two good goals and, crucially, controlling the game. D.O.E.S. and Timor and Ho love control in this formation. Matic D.O.E.S. and T get isolated or quite as obviously knackered hopefully. Our defense is better protected. Pogba gets more freedom and no number 10 in his way. Sanchez, Marshall, Lingard, Rashford all get closer to Lukaku and the goal. While Shaw and Valencia can provide the width with options in the middle and still have two midfielders covering. Recent comments from Morinho about buying central midfielders this summer and the apparent decision not to pursue Ozil have. Given me reason to believe this might be the direction of travel for United over the coming months, however. 
if I'm still having the same moan in a year's time it will no doubt be in the context of another failed title challenge on the back of yet another chastening defeat to decent opposition. Adam will even take three at the back. I'm not greedy. Am UFC defending Conti having read your damning assessment of Antonio Conti's struggles in the league. Please allow me to shed some light on the matter. Chelsea have signed nine players in this transfer window you say? Let's have a look at them. Alvaro Morata, excellent footballer, however. Untested in the Premier League and taking a major step up from his position at Madrid and Juve where he was very much an understudy was doing pretty well up to his case of the Yips against Arsenal where he could easily have won the game on his own. However well has done or not, he was replacing an unreplaceable Diego Costa so for all intents and purposes appears to be a downgrade. Time your back Hayoko again new to the league but coming off a career threatening injury to boot and replacing a name Angelmatic. Who Conti absolutely did not want to see leave until the board got involved. Had no preseason and has been played when useless by Conti. In my opinion is a raspberry to the aforementioned board. Never a Premier League player in a million years and had to deputize for the crocked Canty for the first month of the season. Excellent. Davide Zappa Costa not bad but not Kandreva who Conti was overruled about apparently Ross Barkley asked for. Nangolin and you shall receive Ross Barkley a man with no discernible position in the side and once more coming off an injury with no pre-season whatsoever. Emerson Palmieri asked for Sandro and you shall receive not second choice tells but an Emerson Palmieri. Coming off an injury, are you starting to see a theme here? Danny Drinkwater England legend arrived, you guessed it. Late in the window and injured, but of course, Olivier Giroud a good player. Arrived too late to replace Mitchie in the starting lineup against Bournemouth when the board following their one-in-one -one out policy loaned him to Dortmund. Having spent two weeks wooing at Injeco apparently, Willie Caballero a safe pair of hands, arguably our safest pair. I don't even recall at this moment who the ninth player is in all honesty, they cannot even be at this level of menace. So all in all, to be still in the Champions League, still in the FA Cup, got to the semis of the League Cup and with a chance of a top four finish. I think Conti has done a reasonable job whilst actively being hampered by a board who are literally clueless about the quality of player they are employing. Mark the vast transfer web there seems to have been an awful lot of movement of players between seven Premier League clubs Arsenal, Chelsea, Everton, Liverpool, City, United and Southampton in recent years with the trend continuing this January. In the past year United have signed the best striker from Arsenal, Alexis and Everton, Lukaku. Everton replaced Lukaku with two long-serving former teenage prodigies in Walcott from Arsenal and Rooney from United as well as signing Schneiderlin. Who had earlier left Southampton for United, Arsenal sort of replaced Alexis and Walcott who they had signed from Southampton with Mkhitaryan. Having set a similar precedent when they let Van Persie go to United in 2012 before signing Welbeck in 2014 that same summer. Chelsea finally let Romelu Lukaku leave only to find themselves in dire need of him three and a half years later. After scouring the world for a striker with similar attributes they eventually found one up the road at Arsenal Giroud where he will now play with former Gunners captain Fabregas whilst Chelsea's once magnificent goalkeeper Sek struggles to find form on the opposite goal line. Also leaving Arsenal this year was Oxlade Chamberlain who they Walcotted from Southampton in 2011 could not convince to sign Docting in 2017 and so reluctantly sold to Liverpool who famously love anyone who has ever played for Southampton the Ox and latterly Van Dijk joining Klein. Lovren, Main and probably loads of others I've forgotten in their collection of Saints. Like United they have also circuitously benefited from Chelsea's impatience with young forwards Mo Salah 
who scored two goals for Chelsea in 2013-14, sits on 26 for Liverpool four years later. And former Chelsea manager Jose Mourinho can now call upon Shaw, Southampton, Fellaini, Everton and Mata, Chelsea, at United. Meanwhile, with a minimum of fuss, Man City decided they liked De Bruyne, once of Chelsea, Sterling, once of Liverpool, and Stones, once of Everton, and are now sailing away whilst the rest scramble in the waves. Matt Hennessy to Southampton way we've probably passed most people by this season as we've offered almost nothing. But Southampton are well and truly entrenched in the relegation zone. The 31st January summarized our season perfectly. The culmination of the transfer window ended in disappointed. Despite having sold VVD for £75 even before it started there were still mad attempts on the final day to push through the signing of Quincy Proms. Of course this perfect replacement for Sadio Main didnt happened and we're left with our limited pool of wingers. We did manage to sign Guido Carrillo for our club record around £19 million and he does look like the Graziano Pell replacement we've needed. But this was after attempts to sign Walcott and Sturridge fell short. I'm not convinced either of these two would have been quite right. But the fact that wages was the stumbling block for us but not for Everton and West Brom speaks volumes about where the club is at. The Southampton way was all about doing it the right way with sustainable growth and an economical money ball angle. It looked like it was the right approach for a while, with a year-on-year -year improvement in league positions. But following on from an underwhelming 2016-2017 this season has seen the Southampton way to be exposed as an unsuccessful way to run a football club. We can no longer compete against the majority of other Premier League clubs economically and the mysterious black box of scouting has run dry. The money presumably exists you don't sell that many players and garner that much TV revenue but it isnt being spent. Is it therefore a surprise we're in the relegation zone? On top of this we have a manager who is not working out and a board too proud and stubborn to replace him. His tactics constantly baffle fans, play well and take the lead, sit back and concede, draw, we have drawn to Swansea. Newcastle, Huddersfield, Watford and Brighton, away, through this tactic, that is 10 points dropped from games where we were dominating. The players have the talent but they look rudderless on the pitch and devoid of any real leaders from the playing staff. Last night, versus Brighton this game played out slightly differently in that it was Brighton who took the lead. But despite dominating possession and getting an equalizer we simply didnt have the class to capitalize and dropped yet another two points. The atmosphere was toxic, fans have had enough and sadly this is creeping into the players. It doesnt helped that Pellegrino once again started with our most expensive signings and best loved players on the bench Buffel. Lamina, Gabaidini and Carrillo were in the relegation battle. We hope something will click. Players such as Lamina, Bertrand, Cedric, Romu and Hoibjerg who has been excellent are too good to go down. The problem is that we've seen that before in the Premier League. Nobody is too good to go down and if it happens well have to look at the Southampton way and say it well and truly failed and goodbye to Les Reed and Ralph Kruger and their failed business plan. John Tucker, Southampton salivating after the most recent round of matches and a quietening down period after the January sales. I am now salivating at the prospect of the upcoming knockout round in the Champions League. I am definitely giving Sevilla a shout against this current United defensive mess, whereas before I WOULDNT have. Sevilla have been slowly improving amongst a few blips, this could be the shock of the round. I am not traveling to the Sanchez Pizuin as the ticket prices are so high. By the same token I now see Tottenham even closer to what would be another shock. When comparing experience in the competition, Juve will be a tough nut to crack and are leading their league again. They'll be great games to watch.
more inevitable now or Barca cruising past a disinterested Chelsea, City cruising two and Liverpool drawing twice with Porto. I hope Liverpool go through on the away goals rule though. To finish I'd say Real Madrid are now getting closer to not being eliminated. Ronaldo has found some form and loves playing in Europe. Also Mr Emery has a poor record against Madrid. How I'd love to see Tottenham take on Barcelona in the quarter-finals. Peter Athletic Bilbao had the best transfer dealings. Andalusia leave Leicester alone. I just wanted to defend Leicester over the Mares situation in light of some of the comments I've read. First off, comparing the £95 million price tag put on Mares to the £30 million received for Canty and £20 million that Arsenal would have paid for Vardy is irrelevant. The Canty and Vardy prices were both directly related to release clauses in their contracts. If Mares is keen to leave Leicester, then... With hindsight, he should have had a release clause included within the contract he signed 18 months ago. Comparing his price to the £35 million received for drink water also ISNT quite comparing like for like. The market has moved significantly in the short time since then with the Coutinho and Van Dijk transfers. Leicester quite probably would have accepted £50 million for Mares in the summer, let alone £65 million. The fact that Roma offered only £32 million for Mares just five months ago is indicative of how the market has moved. So what would have been a fair price? Well I think Leicester's £95 million valuation is closer to reality than Man City's £65 million. Especially when you compare to the £142 million paid for Coutinho. It should also be taken into account that the bid was made so late in the window. And so with no time for Leicester to find a replacement you would expect to pay a premium price when Mares does eventually move. Probably this summer, I won't begrudge him, has been a fantastic servant for the club and I believe the vast majority of fans will wish him well when he leaves. It'd like to think the club themselves hold a similar viewpoint but, at the end of the day, they are right to retain his services until a fair offer is made. Hampshire Fox about Mitro Y-D-O-E-S-N-T He get a shot cause has a massive red gi Classic an E term for a needlessly aggressive individual Put simply the man has issues Which usually result in him taking an early bath Even on the rare occasions when Hess scored a goal Hess not happy until Hess unleashed some unprovoked and unsubtle violence and destruction to an opposition player's knee, ankle or face so much effort does he put into inflicting pain on others he then knackers himself out after five minutes and blows out his arse for the remainder of the match unable to press. Run the channels or even perform basic hold-up play. It's not just opposition players at risk of injury either during goal celebrations we used to score a lot in the championship. Honest, his exuberance is quite likely to snap the neck of a teammate via a bear hug. He makes Katsbia look calm and collected. Worst of all he has a faithful cult following amongst a decent proportion of supporters mistaking his red d -ness for effort. Blinded to the fact has a complete liability for us and now for full hmm, Rafa ain't daft, Alex. MUFC cut the mustard can I just say how lovely it was to see Seamus Coleman start for us last night. Always great to see a player come back from such a serious injury but such a wonderful person coming back from it made me feel all warm inside. I eat on EFC, Rome.